So good evening, King of Kings family. We're so glad that you're able to be with us tonight. Uh, it's great to be here tonight. I'm going to be sharing the word with you, but as a uh, welcome, we want to welcome all of you that are joining us online. The team sent me the list. Tonight we have joining us 27 countries, Argentina, Austria, Brazil, Canada, Cook Islands, France, Germany, Holland, Hong Kong, Hungary, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Israel, of course, Italy, Norway, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, Poland, Singapore, Slovakia, South Africa, South Korea, Sweden, Switzerland, the United States, and the United Kingdom. <sighs> Take a breath. If your country was not on that list, please uh, do us a favor. Send a message to one of our service hosts on one of the platforms you're on. Let us know where you're watching from tonight. It's, it's really wonderful to know what countries are joining us and who's with us from week to week. So let us know. But we welcome you. We welcome our wider ministry family that's joining us around the globe. And if you're joining us maybe tonight for the first time online, we welcome you. We're glad that you're able to be with us. And we're going to jump in tonight, but first I want to just give you a quick update uh, about what's happening here in Israel. Last Sunday, uh, some of the restrictions were lifted in regards to general movement, uh, so people were able to go further than a kilometer from their house again, which uh, enabled some things to, to be more open, but we are still uh, in lockdown in regards to group sizes meeting in public spaces. So unfortunately, uh, at this point, we're not able to meet in large groups here in Israel, so we're still not able to meet together in this space, but we'll keep you updated as we get more information in the coming days. Um, and then also, uh, this morning, early in the morning, while many of us were sleeping, or I hope you were sleeping, uh, our clocks changed and shifted back one hour, so if you arrived to our service live stream an hour ago expecting it to begin, that's what happened. Uh, the, the time changed in the middle of the night, so we have now fallen back an hour here in Israel. And then one other thing to note, what's happened uh, this past week here in Israel, is uh, we got our first rains here in Jerusalem, uh, which is a blessing. If you don't know, uh, here in Jerusalem, it does not rain during the summer at all during the summer months. So it gets quite dry, quite dusty. So that first rain that we receive is, is quite welcome. It helps to clear the air a little bit, wash the streets a little bit. I was talking to Pastor Mike, and Pastor Mike told me it rained for almost an hour near where he lives. So we're thankful to the Lord for that first blessing of rain here in Jerusalem. So I'm going to jump in now. We're going to continue tonight in our series that Pastor Chad began last week uh, on magnetism, and I want to just recap a few things real quick that Pastor Chad shared with us last week regarding this series. He said um, that this, by sharing with us this understanding of God's desire to draw himself helps us to keep our eyes on the big picture. So understanding this characteristic of God that wants to draw us to himself helps us to keep our eyes on the big picture. And what is that big picture? It's the larger view of what God desires for the world. He reminded us that God has a purpose for the world. Um, he also reminded us that each of us has a created destiny. And one thing that he said that I really liked, he said, we, we are growing into that destiny. He said, we didn't just arrive one day and we understood everything. Uh, we, don't, we don't get this like a deposit of everything at once and understanding what our God created destiny is. It's a process that God is walking us through, that he's growing us. And then last week he showed us um, from Genesis chapter 3, that God is not running from us because of sin. And if you remember last week, he, he talked from Genesis chapter 3. It's the story of Adam and Eve in the garden after they have sinned. And God comes to the garden and he asks Adam and Eve three questions. He first says, where are you? <laughs> where, where are you guys? And then second, he asks, uh, who told you you were naked? And then finally, the third thing is he said, did you eat from the tree? that I commanded you not to eat from. So God presents himself in the garden, not coming with condemnation, but he comes asking questions, looking to draw near to Adam and Eve. And that's really the message that Pastor Chad set us up with last week. But as I read this week, that passage, as I was preparing for tonight's message, and I went back and, and I, was, I was looking at the passage, something uh, struck me uh, that, that actually isn't there. And I, and I want to present this idea, and that leads us to what we're going to look at tonight as we continue in this series. And what didn't happen in that story is this. After Adam and Eve had sinned, and God comes into the garden, 
And he says, where are you? Adam doesn't step out from behind the tree and say, yeah, God, I'm here. I'm naked. I ate that fruit. And you know what? I really don't care what you think. That didn't happen. And it's an interesting point. He didn't, he didn't step up and say those words. Yeah, now I know everything you know. And so I don't, you know, I don't really care what you think, God. That's not what happened in the story. Adam and Eve hid. And what it shows us is that even in that context, even though they had sinned, there was still an understanding and a respect of the person, the authority of God in Adam and Eve. Even though sin had entered them, they still had a respect for the person and the authority of God. Now, although Adam and Eve's fears were not warranted, they were afraid. That's why they hid. And although their fears were not warranted because God didn't show up and say, hey, I knew you were going to get that fruit. Where are you? Come on, get out here. God didn't show up that way. So their fears weren't warranted because God comes asking, where are you? I'm looking for you, wanting to draw them to himself. But their respect of God was warranted. Even though sin entered the world, they didn't lose the context of who God was and their respect for him. And that's an important idea that's going to lead us into what we're going to talk about tonight. So the message title tonight is Draw Near. And we're going to be looking at a passage, excuse me, in the book of James. And as you might remember, Pastor Chad taught pretty extensively from the book of James uh, about a month or two ago um, in our Faith and Faithfulness series. So if you'd like to look more at the book of James, please go back to the archives. Uh, you can read more or listen more to some of the messages that Pastor Chad and Pastor Mike and others brought in that series. But tonight we're going to go to James chapter 4 beginning in verse 8. So if you take your device, your Bible, uh, whatever you're going to be reading from tonight, if you'll turn with me to the book of James Chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 8. Again, this is a letter written by James, the brother of Jesus, the brother of Yeshua. And this is what this verse says, James chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, I know it continues, but I'm going to stop there, because this was kind of like, for me, this was like mic drop. James could have just ended his message, hey, Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Okay? Got it? Good. Mic drop, walk off the stage. Thank you for joining us. That's the message tonight. Uh, that's, that's all you need to know. But it's not that easy. And James understood this. It wasn't like a just do it campaign. But uh, he, he understood that this wasn't as easy as just that. So he continues with his, his message. And we're going to look at that in a second. But I want you to understand why he's saying this. And I want to I reference back to the passage that Pastor Chad taught from last week in, in uh, Genesis. Because as that story continued, as Pastor Chad told last week, um, the nature of man, as Pastor Chad said, was not to draw near to God. In fact, it was to go the other way. It wasn't to come repentant. Well, God said, where are you? And he said, did you eat the fruit that I commanded, from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Adam basically says, well, wait, well, wait a minute, God. Uh, it, was, it was the woman you gave me. And, and as we read that sentence, you almost, I almost get this feeling of, of kind of Adam putting his hands out and taking a step back. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, God. Did, yeah, God says, did you eat? And he's kind of, wait, 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 wait. wait. Um, and rather than stepping towards God, and this is what Pastor Chad brought to us, that is the nature of man, to, to shift blame, to step back. It's almost as if Adam moved away from God in that moment. And repentance would have been stepping towards God and saying, yes, God. Yeah, I did. I'm sorry. I failed. And that would have been moving towards God. And that's James understands in this passage that that's our nature. Our nature is not to step towards God and repent. Our nature is to step back. Wait, wait a minute, God, wait a minute. And so he, he continues on in this passage, and he says, cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded people. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, double-minded people. So he realizes the impact of sin on our ability to draw near to God. And he, he starts with cleanse your hands. The Greek word used there, figuratively, 
figuratively represents a person's deeds. So if we were to translate that, it's stop sitting in your physical deeds. Stop doing things that are contrary to the nature of God. So that's his first thing. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Stop doing those things that are contrary to the nature of God. And secondary, purify your hearts. And I put it this way, stop making a place for sin to occupy your thoughts. Stop making a place for sin to occupy your thoughts. You know, Yeshua talked a lot about this in his ministry. If you remember, he said, uh, in regards to adultery, he said, if a man even thinks lustfully in his heart regarding a woman, he's already committed adultery. He, said, he, he told his followers, don't even make a place for that. Because what Yeshua knew is what begins in our thoughts, if we water that, if we nurture it, if we allow it to grow, it will become our actions. It will become what we do. So he says, don't, don't allow a place. Purify your hearts. Don't give sin a place to occupy your thought life. This is extremely important because when we allow sin to occupy our thoughts, we become the thing that James says there at the last part of this verse, double-minded. And I'm looking here. He said, yes, double-minded people. When we allow sin to occupy our thought life, we will become double-minded. And double-minded means that there are two conflicting thoughts happening simultaneously. There's two conflicting thoughts happening simultaneously. Turn with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 11. Proverbs, chapter 11, and verse 3. Proverbs 11, 3 says this, the integrity of the upright guides them, but the perversity of the treacherous destroys them. So here in this verse, the integrity of the upright guides them, integrity, but the perversity of the treacherous destroys them. Integrity, perversity. So we have two things that are two paths that are leading in polar opposite directions. One is building up the integrity, guiding. One is tearing down, destroying. But someone who tries to live in the middle of these two contradictory ideas is actually being pulled apart. They're being yanked apart. They're, they're dealing with things like, oh, I, should, I should repent. I should follow God's word. I don't, I don't, I don't want to repent. <laughs> but, but I should repent. God, I, I know I need, oh, but, but I don't, I, I like that. I, and it's this tearing apart trying to go in two opposite directions out at the same time. And the outcome of this back and forth internal dialogue, the outcome will ultimately be confusion. And James, a little earlier in his letter, on verse, uh, chapter one of this letter, if we look at chapter one, verse eight, it says this. He says, a double-minded man, some translations say an undecisive man, but some will also say a double-minded man, is unstable in all his ways. He is confused. He doesn't know which way to go. I don't know if you've ever tried to follow a confused person before, but it's, it's, it's nerve-wracking. <laughs> it's annoying. Um, I've, I don't know, it, it, sometimes you'll follow someone in a car, and they're driving ahead of you, and they're, they're leading the way, and you're in the car behind them, and they don't know where they're going, so they're zipping this way, and you're like, where are you going? It's nerve-wracking. It drives you nuts because it's like, please, just make a decision. Know where you're going. I can follow you. This is insane. You're, you're going to kill me in this process. So following a confused person is not a fun thing, not something that we want to do. So what can we do about this reality if we are in that position of confusion, double-mindedness, or if we know someone that's in this position of double-mindedness or confusion? We can bring clarity to people who are in this place by helping them understand that there's ultimately a root question that needs to be answered in their mind. There's really one question in this context that will, the answer to that question will bring clarity to which direction I need to go. And if we can help them understand this one question, if we can help them answer this one question, the decision process between should I go towards destruction or should I go towards God becomes 
much more easy. And that question is this. Do I need God or not? That singular question, when you come to the conclusion of that singular question and you answer that question, your decisions will become much more clear. It will determine whether I draw near to God or I move away from him. Again, going back to Genesis, even though Adam and Eve had sinned, they were not confused in regards to who God was or their need of him. Again, I gave you the scenario. Adam didn't step out and say, yeah, God, I, I ate it. I, I don't really care what you think. He knew he needed God. He wasn't confused about that at all, even though he had sinned. You see, a double-minded person is flip-flopping on this answer to this question. He's, he's going back and forth. Do I need God? Yes, I need God. Oh, but I don't want to be responsible to God. I don't really need God for that. Or maybe I need God for this. Maybe I need God for eternal salvation, but I don't need him in my day-to-day -day life. I don't need him to tell me what to do. And this back and forth, this flip-flopping on this question, the, the reality is, and this is our key point number one, and they'll put it up on the screen, either we need God or we do not. There is no middle ground in the response to this question. Either we need God or we don't. And there's no, there's no way to live in the middle and flip-flop on that. It's either a decision, yes, I need him, I will move towards him, or I don't need him, I will move away from him. So if we truly need God, we must draw near to him. The person who says, I don't need God, will begin making decisions that will move them away from God. And in fact, going on in this letter, and actually what James is dealing with in many ways through this entire letter is a fundamental thing uh, that actually repels God from us. It actually is something that pushes God away from us. And that thing is pride. Pride will cause us to be separated from God. It does the opposite work of drawing us to him. It repels us from him. And, John, and James, just a little bit earlier, in James chapter four and verse six, it says, God resists the proud. It pushes him away. It pushes him away from us. And that gives us our key point number two we're gonna look at here. As I was looking at magnetism, because that's the theme for this series, and I was looking at some of the laws of magnetism, one stuck out, a basic law of magnetism stuck out to me as I was looking at it. And it's, it says this, let me read it to you. They can put it up on the screen. This is our second key point. A basic law of magnetism, unlike poles attract each other, like poles repel each other. So I'm sure you've all done this if your kids, we've done it with our kids in science experiments. You take two magnets, and a magnet has a positive and a negative pole. So if I, if I take those magnets and I try to push the two positive sides together, at some point once I get close enough, they'll start to actually push away. You can't force them together. They will push away from one another. But if I take one of those magnets and I flip it around and I put the opposite pole, as I start to slide them together, at some point the magnetic properties kick in and it actually draws them together and they snap together and they lock Together, And I thought, wow, what an amazing reality. Because this is what pride is. Because what pride says is, I am going to assume the role of God. I'm going to be him. And we can't be God and he be God at the same time. So when you try to push those two things together, they push away. They repel each other. But if... We humble ourselves and we realize the role that God has given us and we, we accept who God has created us to be, we can actually be drawn to him. James in chapter, in chapter four, verse 10 said this, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. He will raise you up. He will draw you to himself. So in this context, as we humble ourselves, as we don't try to put ourselves in the position of God, he actually draws us to himself. Now I want to make one 
key distinction here in regards to humility. And this is gonna be our third point tonight. Humility is not an unrealistic lowering of ourselves. But rather, humility is the elevation of God to his rightful place. What do I mean by that? Humility is not me saying, oh, I'm nobody, I'm nothing God, I'm not created, I'm not worthy, I'm not this. And lowering myself beyond the position where God created me. That's, that's false humility. In fact, what's happening is I'm actually stepping into the same things that pride would say in that context because I am stepping into the authority of God to determine who he created me to be. He's the creator. I'm the created. He has the right to say who I am, who created me to be. If I even allow other people to define that for me, if I allow other people to say, you're nothing, you, you're, you're, you're worthless, I'm allowing those people to step in the position of God and his authority as the creator. And so again, it's working in the same context. We're stepping into a position, we're trying to step into God's role where we don't need to or we shouldn't step into that role, whether it's us or whether we allow other people to step into that place. So humility is not, again, not a lowering of ourselves to an unrealistic position. God created us, as we said, as Pastor Chad has taught, God created us with a destiny, with a created destiny. He created us with a purpose. We don't need to lower ourselves from that position. We need to accept it, and we need to elevate him to his right position. Now, God exampled this for us in the most amazing way through Yeshua. More than once, it's recorded in the Gospels that God spoke audibly, and he said these words. Listen to this. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. That's recorded in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. Mark chapter 9, verse 7. Luke chapter 9, verse 35. And also 2 Peter, in Peter's letter, 2 Peter 1, 17. And I want to look at this passage specifically from 2 Peter in chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And this is what Peter says. For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. In other words, we didn't make something up. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it with our own eyes. We were there. And for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, a voice came from heaven, from the majestic glory. This is my beloved son. I take delight in him. And we heard this voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the mountain. The disciples heard God speak from heaven. And so we have the prophetic word strongly confirmed. And listen to this. You will do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The example that Yeshua set is he came to earth and he humbled himself. And he submitted himself to the authority of God the Father and the will of God the Father. The word of God says that he submitted himself even unto death. And that humility drew God's presence to him. I was reading this morning, actually, we were reading with our children from Luke chapter 14, and it was a story of Yeshua going to the home of a Pharisee for dinner. And at this point, they're starting to pay attention to him and trying to position uh, ways for him to uh, do things that will basically confirm their suspicions <laughs> and get him in trouble. Uh, and while he's at the dinner, he, he begins to speak and he says, you guys, when you go to a wedding or you go to a banquet, you immediately go to the seats of honor. He said, don't do that. He said, don't go immediately to the place of honor. Go to the lower place. And he said, let the master of the banquet or the, the, the leader of the, of the dinner say, hey, friend, no, no, come up here closer to me. Come up, sit closer. Let them pull you up. Don't just go straight for the head of the table because you think that's the position you deserve. Let them call you up and honor you. And friends, that's exactly what God did when he spoke audibly from heaven so that the disciples could hear it. He 
brought Yeshua, because of Yeshua's humility, that drew, God drew, it was drawing God's presence, and God drew him, and he said, hey, guys, listen, I'm gonna speak from heaven now, listen. My son, I want you to hear this. I'm pleased with him, because he, he's humbled himself, because he does what I've asked him to do, because he's humbled himself, and submitted himself to what I'm desiring to accomplish in the world. And he took Yeshua from his place and it was like calling him to the head of the table. Hey, Yeshua, come stand by me. Come here, guys, listen. Yeshua, come over here and stand next to me. And he speaks and the disciples hear this voice from glory. They're like, oh, okay, okay, God. And, you, and, and Peter here says, look, you would do well to pay attention to this to the person of Yeshua. And why is that important? Because God has gone through great lengths, friends, to extend an invitation for us to draw near to him. God has gone to extreme lengths to extend an invitation for us to draw near to him. And if you're someone here tonight and you're listening, you're watching this message online, and you say, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's, if God really would want me or God is really drawing me. I want to share something with you that the apostle Paul wrote in the first century to the believers in Rome. It's recorded in his letter to the Romans. It's, it's Romans chapter five and verse eight. And the apostle Paul wrote this in Romans chapter five, verse eight. But God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. Paul said, while you were still opposed to God, while you were still walking in the opposite direction, walking away from God with your back to him saying, I don't care, I'm going this way. God still sent his son to earth to die for you, to be able to extend an invitation and to draw you back to himself. What further proof is what Paul is saying? What further proof, friends, do we need of God's desire to draw us to himself? And James further, furthers this idea by saying that the Spirit, so speaking to believers, speaking to followers of Yeshua, that the Spirit in us, who lives in us, yearns jealousy. And tonight, I want to close speaking to us that are followers of Yeshua, believers. And I wanna talk about this particular verse. And I wanna read it to you from James chapter four. So just backing up a little bit, we, we read from verse eight, but we're gonna go back to chapter four, verse four. And I want you to listen to this tonight. He says, adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy? Or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says who lives, the spirit that, who lives in us yearns jealously? And he's saying, friends, don't you know, once you've received the spirit of God and it, it, it yearns, it wants to draw you to itself. It's, it's calling you, it's, it's yearning for your response. And, and for us to turn around and walk away is to come back to the question that I asked earlier. Do we need God or don't we? Where are we on that question? Because if I need God, I, I need to be walking towards him. I need to be moving towards him. So what is it that the spirit of God in us as believers yearns jealousy for? I wanna highlight three things tonight. Now this could be a longer list, but I wanna highlight three things tonight. In closing, number one, the Spirit of God, he yearns for our praise. Now, praise is declaring what God has done, is doing, or will do. And thankfulness is a component of praise. Recently, Apple released some new iPhones, and I, I know probably some people are like, ooh, I'm looking forward to an iPhone 12. It's gonna take beautiful pictures. And we can give credit, and we can say, oh, thank you, Apple, for making such a beautiful product. But let's back up a minute. Who put this stuff in the earth 
that allows us to make that iPhone? Who gave humanity the wisdom and the ability and the ingenuity to design something like that? So who really deserves thanks in this context? Yes, men designed it. Men took the things that God put in the earth and developed it into something. But we should thank God. God, thank you for technology. Thank you for the things that you have given to us in humanity to allow us to develop such amazing things. So God and his spirit in us yearns for our praise. So guys, let's not be silent when God acts, when God moves, when God does things in our lives. Let's not hold our tongue in regards to praise him. I was speaking to my wife and she's been doing a study with the moms group on thankfulness, on gratefulness and gratitude. And they've been reading from a book and she said, Ray, she said, there's a story, you should really read it. And I said, yeah, let me, let me, let me take that. And I want to read it to you tonight. It's from the book that they're reading called Choosing Gratitude, Nancy Lay DeMoss. And listen to this. Um, it's, it's a story. It says, Marvin Olasky, the editor-in-chief of World Magazine, recounts a conversation he had with a successful writer who was an atheist who mentioned how thankful he felt during a recent vacation as he splashed in the ocean absorbing the overwhelming beauty all around him, the, the settled feeling of being surrounded by the water's relaxing rhythms. But pressing him, Dr. Olasky asked whom the man was thanking. Maybe the book buyers who had contributed to, his, contributed to his affluence, not that they had created the ocean. Maybe his parents or his wife. Of course, they didn't create the ocean either. The point is, true thankfulness requires a you to say thank you to. And to be thankful to the living God implies a corresponding level of trust in him that can only reside in a believer's heart. So being thankful, declaring God's praise, telling others, this is what God has done for me. This is what God is doing for me. Declaring thankfulness to God for those things is what one of the things that the spirit of God in us is yearning for. Number two, the Spirit of God in us is yearning for our trust. Trust is not afraid to admit, I need you. Trust is not afraid to say, God, I need you. When we don't trust, that's when things begin to change. In our world today, we see a lot of things happening as I read news stories. When we look at positions of authority in our world today where trust is breaking down, let's use, for example, let's say uh, the police and uh, authorities in different countries where people begin to lose trust. And what happens is in that context, when trust is, is lost in that, when that authority comes and says, uh, gives an instruction, then our response is not, yes, sir, I respect your authority. Our response is, who are you? Because <laughs> I don't trust you. You see? So when trust is not in the, the picture, and we begin to lose respect for that. So God desires our trust because our trust says to God, you are God. I trust you. I trust you to make the right decisions. I trust you and your purpose and your plan for my life. And God, I'm not afraid to say, I need you. I need you. So the spirit of God in us is yearning for trust. So number three, he yearns for our worship. Now our worship is the outward expression of an inward truth, what we truly believe. It is the outward expression of our trust in him, our need for him, our desire to be with him. So the spirit longs for our worship. I was reading a few weeks ago, from a book from a worship pastor, Zach Cadiz. Um, Zach, for many years, was a worship pastor with, with Gateway Church in Dallas, Texas. And he wrote a book called How to Worship a King. And, and I was reading from this book in context, and I thought, wow, this, this kind of sums up some of what, what I want to say tonight. So I want to read to you for a minute. But just to kind of give us a, a precursor of where he's coming from, he's talking about um, the engagement ring that a, a, a groom or a prospective groom puts on the, his betrothed 
And what value is it? He's, a, he's giving the story like when a, when a young woman gets engaged, she walks into the room, you know, with the hand out in front of her. <laughs> and, you know, but, but what is there? There's value in that. Why? Because to the woman, this is him saying, I'm showing you how much you're worth to me. And, and again, not that we can put worth in a, in a, in a band, in a, in a piece of stone, but it's an expression. It's an expression of, I was willing to eat macaroni and cheese for six months to save up the money because you're worth that much to me. So Zach is talking about this idea of the engagement ring as something that identifies value or worth. And this is what he says in this book. Listen to this. What is the cross? It is the engagement ring of the Messiah bought at the price of God's own son to woo the heart of the bride away from her other suitors and prove once and for all that he loves her more than life. As again, we read from Paul speaking to the Romans, folks, what more proof do we need that while we were still walking away from God, going the other direction, he gave his life for us to show us how much we were worth. The gospel is our engagement ring and it says everything the world needs to know about the groom who is pursuing us. If the cross proves how much we are worth to God, our worship proves how much God is worth to us. We are surrounded by a world that thinks we are delusional. Our engagement, ring, our engagement to him is a myth and the way we live often proves their doubts. The church doesn't act like we are engaged to the King of Kings. We don't act betrothed. We act like we are single, like we are still playing the field. We sow our affections about like, we, we sow our affections about like we are still shopping, not like we have already found our true love. Heaven is watching and wondering, do they really love the God of all the universe? Hell is watching and wondering, do they really believe? Do they really love him? Or are they ineffectual, powerless, contemptible, and fruitless? The lost are watching and wondering, listen to this, do they really believe what they say they believe? Does their God really exist? Is he really lovable? Does he have the power to save and transform? Is he worth following? Is he worth living for? What they are really asking is show me the ring. Worshipers, priests, pastors, listen. Our worship communicates more to the world than you know. Our worship shows the world how valuable our God is. Our worship demonstrates that we have a savior worth loving, worth living for, and if needed be, worth dying for. So these are the things that the Spirit of God is longing for. Our praise, our thankfulness, our gratitude, our trust the willingness to say, God, I need you. And our worship, our expression of his worth. Worship comes from, the English comes from worth-ship, expressing his worth. So tonight, let us be like Yeshua. Let us draw near to God and attract his presence. And in order to do that, we have to first answer that question, do I need God or not? Second, in humble submission, we must acknowledge God's authority in our need of him. We must give him our praise, our trust, and our worship. We must remember that it is God's presence, listen to this, it is God's presence that is the element of change in us and ultimately in the world around us. We need him. Our world needs him. I want you to think of one thing tonight. If going back to Adam and Eve in the garden, if after the sin of Adam and Eve, after their fall, God never returned to the garden, it would be a very different story. God never walked back into the garden and said, where are you? It would be a very different story. If God washed his hands and said, no, I'm done. But folks, he didn't. 
He stepped into the picture and he has stepped into the picture throughout history over and over and over again to tell us you are worth so much to me and I want to draw you to me. Let's pray tonight. God, we are so grateful tonight. We are so grateful that you did step back into the garden. God, we're so grateful tonight that you did send Yeshua to this earth. Yeshua, we are so grateful tonight that you humbled yourself and you were obedient to the will and the purpose of your Father. And we ask you, Lord, help us. Help us, God, to be people that draw and attract your presence, God. Be people that affect the world around us because it's your transforming power, it's your presence that will affect us, it will affect the world around us. Help us, we pray, God. And again, we are so thankful for you. Thankful that you call us and us. We give you the glory tonight.